welcome to the Precision Teaching Podcast. My name is Rick Cabina, and tonight I'm joined by Doug Kostowitz. Hello there. Carrie Milico. How's it going? And Sean Dachik. Hello. Well, you know, I, I realize this, but now I have an official rogues gallery. You're all my rogues. For your rogues? Yes, you know a rogues gallery, how superheroes have a rogues gallery of uh, of rogues? You're my no. rogues gallery. I grew up with Barbie dolls, so yeah, so, no. So you must be Ken then, Rick, right? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Rogues Rick's gallery. Ken. I'm like Batman and, you know, you're the Riddler and... Wait. So, or maybe you're the Penguin. Oh, we're the bad guys. You're the you're the good guy. And we're the bad guy. Penguin. I call Catwoman. You're rogues. Oh, okay. Well, then I want to be uh, Two Face then. So we are. Uh, we have a full show tonight. Lots of information. So why don't we just jump right into our education news? And uh, you know, last last. Last month, we had some, I guess we could classify the news on the negative side of the ledger. And sure enough, uh, our information that we're going to share today is also uh, on that negative side. So the article that, uh, or the news item that we reviewed is, uh, it deals with California. And California has a a second year science graduation requirement, which means for students to graduate high school, they have to have two, two years of science classes. And what's happening is the governor, Governor Jerry Brown, is, has decided that he would like to eliminate one of those years of um, one of those years for the graduation requirements in this is unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but fortunately, uh, a lot of people are reacting very negatively to this news. How does this compare with other states? Do other states do one or two or more? Do we know this? That's a good question. I don't know how this compares to other states, but I know in doing research on California, and this would also be true in Pennsylvania, that uh, when you go to apply to a university, for example, if you're going to the UC system, you, they, they require two years of science. So what's going mm -hmm. to happen is the, the people that don't have the two years of science, well, they're going to either have to take remedial classes or they're not getting in. Right. I guess the bigger question is, what's the, uh, and this is more of a rhetorical question, what's the problem with not interacting with and appreciating science at that, I, I, I would argue that maybe a high school is a more advanced level than through um, your 6th, 7th, 8th grade um, courses, but interacting with science at a little bit higher level, what, what, do, what are kids going to lose? I don't think that they have the kids in mind when they're thinking about cutting the classes. I think it's, you know, you're right. Yeah. How, how are they going to be harmed from getting an extra class? But unfortunately, I don't think they're viewing it that way, it seems. I mean, there's, I guess, a big critical thinking component that is being missed in this. Obviously, it's never about the kids. It's always about where they can cut and save the money. But if you're interacting less with data and you're interacting less with the experimental method, then you're no longer questioning things like you should be and, and being at least minimally skeptical of just uh, everyday statements. And it's creating a yeah. situation that puts kids just an acceptance of authority rather than questioning yes. and asking or even just asking the question, not even in a nasty way, just saying, OK, well, then, you know, oh, so this pill doesn't make me lose weight regardless of what I eat. <laughs> I think that's so true. My husband and I have conversations about this all the time that high school or school in general outside of, you know, just up through high school and even some colleges they don't teach you how to think 
critically. And I think science is one of the few classes that gives the students an opportunity or gives the teachers an opportunity to train students how to think critically. And now you're saying, okay, well, they're only going to have one class that gives them an opportunity to do this, as opposed to rote memorization and just learning so that they can take a test and pass out or whatever it is. It's, you're right, exactly what you're saying, Doug, just to ask, know what questions to ask even, and having the guts well, to that ask. that you should even ask a question. Right. See, just understanding that it's not just like history and they just present facts and information and memorize the facts. synthesizing literature whatever you're actually asking does this do this what effect does this have on this and you can say oh, i think it's gonna have no effect and then you run it through and say well it did have this effect or you know what it did have no effect but it's that it's the it's the it's the scientific method of asking the question and performing some type of experiment that culminates in some type of hopefully quantifiable data. But it can even be extended beyond just experiments. It's just everyday life. You're thinking about buying a car, a certain car, and you think about all the different questions that you can ask about, well, let me look at this and this and this, and what about if I do this option? Or maybe if I buy it through eBay or AutoTrader or maybe go to the – like just knowing to look at all the different angles and all the different – I don't know, the questions that you can come up in different scenarios – Science teaches you to do that, or, or a science class would prepare the student to look at it that way. So, yeah, experiment and everything like that. Um, and if a student likes science and they keep on, you know, to become a scientist down the road, and that's super awesome. But that is just an amazing, like, skill that they will learn that can be, you know, help them in the future and just daily living. Mm -hmm. the, the big problem, if you think on a statewide basis – you are trying to, when you erode a state's scientific and technological literacy, you're just screwing your state. And, of course, you're not just screwing your state. That contributes to our country. Right. No wonder we're falling behind in that area. And also, the other thing that I find disturbing about this is it, it ultimately there's going to be a divide here, an academic divide School districts that have resources, guess what? They're going to keep their two years of science, but guess which group of kids aren't going to get the two years of science? Those kids that go to schools that are economically in trouble, and you can imagine you know, where these kids are all at. So it's just uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, the governor is sticking to his guns and is planning to, to do this. You know – I think of um, some of these bigger corporations, you know, sciency corporations or something, which I don't know names of. But, um, you know, you could just think of all of, like the technology and all the other kind of stuff, especially in California. Right. Would they ever, you know, think about having some sort of initiative for them to donate to the school system so that, you know, they use these funds specifically for these what does it say in the article, like, that it's more expensive to to have the second science class because you use a lot of things in, in like, conducting the experiments and stuff? I mean, I wonder if they've even thought about having some of these corporations say, like, help us keep the science class and make a donation to to help preserve, you know, that second class. But the school districts don't have a problem putting together football uniforms and football shin pads and elbow pads and shoulder right. pads and right, right, sports right, right. equipment. And now some schools have cut those, too, because they can't afford them. So I'm not. Right. But it, it's it's a priority situation. Mm -hmm. And they're choosing that this is the this. They are viewing it as the most expensive with, I guess, the least payoff. And they're, they don't understand that that's probably arguably has could hurt them the most so in one of the comments some some guy said that this actually cutting this extra science class would not really save any money unless they're reducing the number of credits mm -hmm. that are required to get a diploma and I thought that made a lot of sense 
Yeah. So, I mean, is that even, you know, is that even going to, I mean, because that's their sole purpose, right? Is to save money by cutting this class. Yes. Well, here's the math behind it. The In 2005, when this was mandated, the state was on the hook to pay $250 million a year. The state has yet to make one payout. So right now, the state owes $2.5 billion in unpaid claims. And okay. so it's like they have a big credit card. This, so this was mandated in 2005. And so now, not only do they have a two. Two point five million bill, but every year they keep getting this two hundred and fifty million dollar cost, which the state's supposed to fund for the second year of science, and they're just like, well, here's the answer to this: we're just cutting it out. Oh, uh, so right. yeah, yeah, you can think of like the Gates Foundation, and uh, there are people that donate money, but geez, you know, this is we're talking huge dollars over time. Turns the billions, yeah. yeah. And when you're I'll... when you're a state, you know, you have to prioritize and. You know, STEM education, you hear about it all the time. You hear about it from presidents. You hear about, I mean, you just hear about this from all kinds of people, but it's always interesting when you look, when people start making cuts, what's the first thing that they start looking at cutting? They look at cutting services for kids. They look at cutting services from the poor. They look at education. You know, there's just some easier targets to cut. All right, let's move on to science news. We have a article uh, that we're reviewing that came up in the news and this uh you know th this a lot of things that we talk about in this show we talk about things that are education related and we also talk about we have the science of precision teaching and some of these science things tend to fall in with you know this is the precision teaching podcast and some of our stories do uh, this one does have a connection which we'll talk about later but this story is about, uh, I, I tell you, I don't know how people can do this, but they're doing it. In North Carolina, there's a bill that's being proposed, and the bill that is called uh, House Bill 819, what they're trying to do is they're trying to legislate, um, I guess they're trying to, to legislate Against science. Yeah, against science. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you follow the science news, it's an estab it's Well, it's established. When we talk about science, this is the thing that people don't understand. We don't have anything that we could say, this is proven, this is 100% happening, you know, because science deals in probabilities. And in terms of probabilities, yes, it's very probable that we have climate change. It's a real thing. You know, oceans are rising. When you talk about climate change, it's not just the temperature. There's all kinds of things that are affected by climate change. So, you know, we, if you've ever been to North Carolina, you've visited, the, I mean, they just have beautiful beaches and the, the tons of tourism that goes to that. And what this... Uh, news stories talking about is how the government is trying to legislate what the um, the sea level rise should be. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. This is such a case of the Wizard of Oz where he's, you know, ignore <laughs> the man behind the, the thing. Pay attention to this over here. It's not this. What's behind the curtain isn't real. Uh, the no, the 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 assertion that policy as you were saying rick and you you didn't i probably interrupted you but to finish what you were saying the multitude of data by the people who know this stuff is that it's it suggests that it's happening right sea yes. levels are rising there is climate change a bunch of policymakers can't say that that they ignore the data that is so outlandish. And this this article was written by a uh, research professor in um, geology. No, um, no environmental. Eh, let's see. I'll have it right now. Uh, oh, geological sciences mm -hmm. at ECU. So this is someone who's in that world. 
and he's saying you can you can't do this. And so I, I just read that, and I, I my mouth was agape the entire time. Yeah, this is what is disturbing about this. Why do you think they're legislating this? Save money. Yeah, I mean, right now it's exceptionally short short sighted. If they can show, I mean, they, there are certain people who's going to benefit from this. If if we don't have, if you're in South Carolina, and you know you don't have ocean rise, who immediately and maybe in the next ten twenty years is going to benefit from that? You mean the the people who live on the ocean? Well, uh, <laughs> think about interest. You have real estate interests. Oh, you have tourism yeah. interests. Well, and that's why I was thinking it's in their best interest to look at the data. If I'm a developer, because, you know, at the end, he's he says, you know, this is obviously an opinion piece. And at the end, he's, you know, he's saying, like, uh, let's not allow North Carolina's coastal system to become another example of folly by allowing greed and ignorance to trump the science. And I'm thinking the greed, well, the people who are going to be greedy in this situation are going to be those people who are developing their residential areas or the high rises or resort areas and that coastal. But then I'm thinking, well, if I was a developer, I would want to know the science because that would be a poor investment if I built on an area that was going to be eroded in the next five to 10 years. Well, in longer shoot. than that. It might be right. 20 years, but unless you can get out before – because right now nobody wants to say it's happening because they're in it. So they want a few years to get – the they, the people that have – Because they're already in it. They right. want to get out of it to get someone else in it so that they end up losing the money. Yeah, what if you and maybe are – maybe I just like screwing people over so that <laughs> – it makes sense to me. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, let's, let's suppose you're a developer right now and you're living in North Carolina and you just invested $5 million in prime land. What's going to happen if, if you listen to the scientists who say, oh, well, guess what's going to happen to this development that you're going to make that you've just spent all this money on in 20 years from now? Because the climate change – and this is the thing with the science. They can make models and make predictions, but it's not exact. You know, it's, there's, there's error bars, right? It, it could be uh, depending on different uh, factors and that the, the oceans could rise more. You know, right. and, and it's not just the oceans rising, it's all of these significant weather events that we're having. You know, the, yeah. there's the storm surge that happens. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's just, uh, you know, erosion, uh, the, the weather patterns with the winds and I mean, everything that, that can happen. So uh, if you have money invested now, if you're trying to, to turn land right now, it is in your economic interest to, to, to ignore the data. Yeah. Or uh, to adopt what the General Assembly of North Carolina is doing. And, the, do. and think of the lifespan of a legislator. It's not exactly. that long in comparison right. to. So they're in and they're out. They get what they need out of the system. And then they're gone and leave it to the next group. These people aren't lifers. There may be five years. So, yeah, in their, in their political lifetime, they'll be fine. They'll well, get a special interest and move on. And the people who are making – who are the lawmakers in, at that level are likely the people who probably have ownership of that land. Yeah. And so they're making legislation that is in favor <laughs> of whatever they wanted to be in favor of to make them happy and, and – get them money. It's like the, you guys see that documentary, the inside job about the bubble bursting in, in our economy. I didn't no. see it. Oh, no. it was awesome. But anyways, but it's, it's kind of like when you have these, I mean, like if you have people who have something invested and then they became the lawmakers, then it, they're not making the decision based on what's good for the general public. What's based on science. It's all based on greed. Well, and that's that. any time the way politics it's, is run now, exactly. special interests. So this, this doesn't surprise me, but it's amazing that 
a situation can just blatantly – I guess the more we talk about it, the less it surprises me. We well, do this about other things. They try to legislate other things too. I mean the role of tobacco. I mean the, so – I mean, anyway. it says one sentence in here. It says that under the method spelled out in the bill, state policymakers would not be allowed to use any predictive modeling data. Mm-hmm. It, but but how? It, how are they not allowed to? It's, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's illegal. They have the the. Do the, not read this data. Do not look yeah, at it. Not you're not. A, they have the model police. They come around and, and erase it off your computers. <laughs> Jeez, a whiz! Well, you got to stand out with a cup and make sure the winds. That you have to stand on the beach with a ruler and see if it's coming up. <laughs> yeah, I think oh, that's where probably Doctor. I think that's probably where Doctor Riggs is. I, I sort of assume that that was hyperbole. Um, uh, maybe I maybe I'm in the minority on that because he uses some pretty strong language, which I get the point because this is a persuasive article right. rather than sort of. Yeah, rather than sort of it following sort of strict tenets for journalistic integrity or journalistic uh, objectivity. Um, but I think – so I definitely get everybody's points is that, sure, are there decisions made in governments that aren't for the best of reasons? Um, yeah, I'm sure that happens. Um, on, I guess on uh, on a practical side, I don't know too much about this bill, but um, it seems like if I was a governing agency or – even just out of my own pocketbook, and I want to make decisions. I don't want. I don't want a cocktail party. So what I mean by that is I don't want to generate a bunch of conversation and evidence just to generate it. I do want to fund the sources where I think that the best data is going to come from. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. Again, I don't know too much about what this, where this data source is, and I don't know a whole lot about. Uh, geology. So I'm really stepping out of sort of my uh, comfort zone on this. Um, But at least from a practical side, it seems like I could see how this decision could get made. Because if you are facing a budget deficit, you can only fund so much art research and development. Um, You probably are just going to narrow down your funding streams to which whoever is in your ear telling you that this is going to be the best data you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when that starts to circumvent what the scientists say, we have a problem. Uh, I downloaded the 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 House bill, and I this is the part that I want to read to you all, which I found particularly egregious, and this t- fits into precision teaching, uh, at least some of the things we talk about. So this is uh, this says the division of coastal management shall be the only state agency authorized to develop rates of sea level rise and shall do so only at the request of the commission. <laughs> these rates shall only be determined using historical data, and these data shall be limited to the time period following the year 1900. Rates of sea level rise may be extrapolated linearly to estimate future rates of rise that shall not include scenarios of accelerated rates of sea level rise. Rates of sea level rise shall not be one rate for the entire coast, but rather the division shall consider separately ocean front in uh, estuarine shorelines. So, I mean, digest that for a minute. Number there's, one, uh, this division of the coastal management, they're the only agency that's allowed to do this. But what really gets me is number one, they're only using data, uh, or number two, from 1900, and they're using linear extrapolation. So what is linear extrapolation and linear growth? When you have linear growth, and this is what happens when you chart data on an equal interval chart or a linear chart, that means that you are make the assumption that the quantity that you have is increasing by a constant amount in a constant time period. So, for example, if you put $10 underneath your pillow every week when you got paid, then your money is growing linearly. You keep sticking $10 under your pillow every pay period, so that's a constant amount for a constant time period. Now, exponential growth, exponential growth, this is uh, when people are doing models and when people who are part of what's called system dynamics – 
what they're looking at, they look at exponential growth. And exponential growth means that you have a quantity that's increasing by a constant percentage in a constant time. And when you have exponential growth, your amount of change keeps getting bigger and bigger uh, exponentially. So that change is much, much bigger. And when you look at a complex system, I mean, if we're looking at behavior, which is what we all look at, or if you're looking at something like climate change, that requires lots of factoring in lots of different variables and exponentially looking at the change. When you put this back to linear growth, then um, you know you're just saying, "Hey, look, you're 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 not as being as sophisticated in terms of your model that you could be." And when I read that. I was just like, wow. So, you know, they're saying this is the only group who can do it. This is the data they'll have, and they can only use linear extrapolation to figure out where they're going, which is going to um, misrepresent the data. Yeah, thank you for that's exactly right. No, but don't we have those sorts of? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no I'm, go ahead. Don't, some. don't we have those sorts of restrictions on things such as educational research? Um, for example, the the notions of research-based or research-validated reading instruction programs, those are narrowing the range of what what society or what the bill makers deemed as accept, acceptable evidence. Again, I'm not trying to defend um, the, what they're saying in geology because I, I, I don't know anything about that. Um, but at least from a theoretical perspective, it seems like don't we do that across societal domains already or academic domains? Um, in in our academic domain, though, the arbiter of what is research base is filtering it through science. Here, they're not saying let's let all the ideas filter through science. What they're saying is this division of coastal management is going to be the only agency that's going to do it, and here's the rules that they're going to follow. And when you limit an analysis, you don't you just like I said before, you misrepresent data. And I'll argue with. It. Back with you, Sean, that nobody tells me what to research. And if I can pull together a long enough research line and then I can get another bunch of people looking at that same thing and that gets shared with the community and that's accepted, it's published, eventually that could meet some type of final this is research based and then it could meet the criteria. And uh, maybe that's what you said already, Rick. But no, I don't see the same. Um, I don't see the same yoke put on on educational research that I'm hearing in this that that this legislative body is trying to do to science. Well, I, I'm not sure if the legislative body is doing anything to science. It seems like they're doing it to a, a government agency. That's what they look for reports. Where I'm not quite sure your analogy quite fits with that because you're at an institute of higher education. That they, so they aren't they aren't they aren't mandating what researchers at University of North Carolina can research because you can research. I mean, we live in a democratic society where we could research theoretically whatever we could afford to do. Um, I'm, I'm not reading it from that bill. Is that what this bill saying, Rick? Is that they're saying that nobody can do research along that lines, or just that when it comes to their decisions, they they probably just won't look at it? Yes, it's the yeah. latter. The mm -hmm. latter is where the problem lies. But That's every government the... agency does that, including the education. I mean, if, if you look at so when if you look at funding streams, if funding streams are going to research validated reading instruction programs, then they they are in essence saying we're ignoring other uh, other um, sources of data. Again, I'm not saying I you know I have to agree with a lot of what's in research uh, research based or research validated reading instruction practices, but. They are doing the same thing that I would say that this governing agency is doing. You know, you do have a point there because, you know, the Department of Education isn't looking at precision teaching research, nor are they really thinking that single case design holds much value mm -hmm. in comparison to these large group studies. Um, but maybe it's different in the sense that this bill is saying they're not allowed to do it versus them just saying, I don't want to. 
the way it, it should work in our educational field is there's a reason why we focus on research base because the idea behind that is if you do research on something and you have a predictable effect, then you know, leveraging science and leveraging research, you make a decision to select from among different programs that have research versus things that have no research or, again, ostensibly things that have been researched and shown not to work. That's the way it's supposed to work in in our field, but certainly I would I would agree that it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, because it seems like you're still going at you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm completely for uh, a free and open democratic scientific, scientific society that can fund sort of these very important socially valid endeavors um, across uh, academic domains. I, 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 am, I do wonder how much so... I, I guess we're starting to get into what the intent of the bill maker or sort of this legislative body is. Is the intent sort of like what we were talking about in the article that we brought up earlier about funding a second year of science? Is it is is this a financial motive purely um, that they're just trying to sort of manage their finances better um, in the short term for potential um, negative effects at the in the long term that is for the consumer to figure out and the voters to figure out I mean we can speculate uh, I, you, you know I sense in listening to this if they would have stopped and said we're only going to look at data from our people okay then it, it may fit a little bit better than with what you were saying but they're actually controlling the type of analyses the, the the type of analyses that researchers are trying to do yeah. and you and we know as as practitioners and and scientists we look at data and we look at it in different ways and different displays as you mentioned Drake provide different levels of information that in what we do and if there was no if there wasn't a negative side to this they would not limit the analysis they may limit in the money situation hey we're only going to pour money into this agency because we believe that's the people that know the best and come back and tell us what that data say right. and yeah. that, that's not what they're saying they're saying not only can you not do this we only want it in this format with this conclusion, there's a preconceived nature, and that's that's shady. That's not science. Right. Here's the They're analogy. Not to chase the data. Yeah. Here's the analogy. Um, the University of Pittsburgh shall be the only state institution authorized to develop reading rates, and shall do so only by the request of PDE. <laughs> uh, these rates shall be determined using um, Upper Sinclair District, and these data shall be limited to 1990 to 2000. I mean, imagine if, <laughs> right? This, I mean, that's the level of what they're doing. They're ignoring, and they just don't. They're trying to legislate. Who does this analysis and where it comes in? In decisions will be made based on that. So even though here I am at Penn State and people Clarion and everywhere else is doing research, uh, yes, we have the right to do that, but. This bill is saying this is what we're paying attention to, and this is how we're going to pay attention to it. Isn't that analogous though to the National Reading Panel? Um, I I don't think it is because the National Reading Panel was convened to look at all of the evidence to sift through the evidence and come up with a descriptive report of what they found. Well. That was a great discussion. You know, Sean, I like you being devil's advocate. You yeah, uh, really pick up like... some very good points. And when we go, when we talk about you know, education news and science news, uh, some of these, you know, these things, we're dealing with science, and it's complicated, and there's lots of 
um, important ramifications that are made based on science and information. So always keeping on top of things and trying to figure out you know, what things mean is, is important. Okay, let's, uh, we are going on at a good clip. Let's talk, let's move on and talk about our article. And <laughs> this article is, um, I'm laughing about it because although it was like a four pager, I don't know that I've read such a dense article uh, in a while. The article. Glad it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. It's called, I thought maybe my, uh, when I read as in a Sea Say Learning channel as opposed to a Sea Think channel, since I read this story out loud while I was rocking my daughter, it was like, man, does my reading comprehension, uh, is it not as good as it is in a Sea Say channel as it is when I do a hear or a Sea Think? But uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty meaty. Yeah, this article is called Historical Science, Experimental Science in the Scientific Method. And when this came out in 2001, this was uh, written as a response to a previous article. And uh, one of the editors of Nature was uh, Henry Gee, who was disparaging um, other sciences. And uh, this author, um, Carol Clellan, she wanted to point out that, look, there are lots of ways of doing science, and we need to be very careful about you know, saying this is the best science and other sciences are inferior. And there, there's biases in, in science, and of course science is a human activity, and because humans are fallible, science is fallible. But even with that being the case, this article, I think, does a fabulous job of explaining science and talking about um, how is science vetted and it's, it's just a very deep and dense article that talks about and of course it talks about mainly how historical science is we're talking about uh, you know, paleontology is a historical science geology is a historical science even astronomy you can think of as a, a historical science how that these sciences are just as legitimate as you know the queen of science, which people would consider physics and chemistry. I like how, um, well, here's my question. When he's talking about the difference, oh, let's see here, in the second paragraph, that um, the author said, oh, gosh, it was like one for... Okay, here we go. Historical science looks for confirmation while experimental science looks for, um, ref how do you say that word? Refutation? No? Yeah, refutation, that's okay. a word. Okay, well, yeah, I didn't know if I was pronouncing it correctly. Where is discovery in all that? I'm trying to figure out where you are on this article. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, or second paragraph, second sentence. On the first page? Yeah, that's all. That's the only one that I had. The first paragraph. I, all I have is just one page. <laughs> oh, you only have one page. You you missed uh, two, three, and four. This is a four okay. pager. Right, uh, Rick. The the, <laughs> the link you sent out was to the comment, the commentary reply. That was a one yeah, pager so at the end of the article. Was... So okay. we actually don't have the main article that you're probably referencing. Well, well, well. <laughs> Gosh, I really wish I had the main article because it's he's referring to things that I can't grasp. And so it was kind of hard for me to read this thing. So I had to read a couple times. I'm like, well, maybe he's talking about this. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll make this science uh, discussion then fairly quick here since you <laughs> didn't have the article. Uh, I'll put the link up to the actual article that you can download. I didn't realize I did that. Uh, my mistake, I beg your forgiveness. In precision teaching, and if you're listening to this podcast and you've, you've come across us, one of our bents is that we all appreciate science. We appreciate science because 
It is an orderly process for discovering information. As far as I'm concerned, the crowning achievement of our species so far has been science. It has, if you think about all of the incredible discoveries that we've made from science, you know, what can compare to it? It's just incredible. And uh, looking at the different sciences, and what this article does is it goes into, uh, and it reveres science, and it talks about different kinds of sciences. So there's experimental science, and you can do experimental science when you arrange, if you, if you can control variables and you can apply those variables. For example, if we're working with a student, we can give that student a particular intervention, and then we can observe what effects. That's experimental science. If we're interested in how the world was created and we wanted to go back to the Big Bang, we're not going to be doing any experiments on that, right? We, we just can't control those events. But that doesn't mean we can't figure out what's been happening. So there are historical sciences that look at how the universe was created. There are historical sciences that look at uh, how is evolution uh, how is evolution played out? So there's a lot of interesting you know, the dinosaurs. Uh, there is the KT extinction event. How you know what happened to the dinosaurs? Again, it's detective work, and this article goes into defending historical science and explaining the differences between historical science and experimental science. And this was all set up in the original article because. Uh, you know the, the the past editor of Nature in Nature, you know, hey, that's one of the most prestigious journals we have when it comes to science. He was attacking, uh, you know, the scientific status of uh, some of the hist historical sciences, and you know, he made the comment that he said, um, "Let me pull this out for you." Uh, in his words. They can never be tested by experiment, and so they are unscientific. No science can ever be historical. So this article was written in response to that comment, and then it goes into explaining about what historical sciences are. It also explains about experimental science. And I hope you all have a chance to read this because it's a very nice piece. With that, why don't we move on to our interview? I would like to welcome Dr. Kendra Brooks Ricard to the Precision Teaching Podcast. Kendra, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As has become my tradition, I'd like to start off by asking you how did you get into precision teaching? Well, um, my first exposure to the chart um, was back in uh, the early 1990s. No, I guess late 1990s. About 1998, I started working at a group home in Florida and uh, really had just been exposed to behavior analysis. And at this particular group home, uh, Dr. Pat McGreevy um, was on the board of directors. And uh, the first measurement system that I ever learned how to use in behavior analysis was the chart. Um, I wouldn't say I was doing precision teaching necessarily at that point, but I was using the chart to take data. Um, it really wasn't until I came to UNR um, that I was exposed to uh, using the chart in action in um, a precision teaching learning center um, called the Center for Advanced Learning. Um, and uh, that was in 2002. Okay. And who would you, who, well, who do you list as your chart parent? Well, I put Pat McGreevy slash Kimberly Barons. Uh-huh. Like I said, I was exposed in the uh, those early days, but I really didn't fully grasp the utility. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had a few years there where I moved away from the chart and did um, good old uh, Excel graphing. And then I, when I came to UNR, I started working with Kimberly within my first week here. Uh, so it was pretty quick that I was uh, exposed to the chart and all of its wonderful utilities. Mm -hmm. So you found your way in 
some people find their way into precision teaching through doing a practice intervention and looking at fluency, but you actually found your way in through the chart. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was the only form of measurement that we used um, in that particular group home. Hmm. Fascinating. Now you are uh, at, well, tell me about what you're doing now with your job. Okay. Um, through my, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I started as a research assistant with Kimberly Barons when I first came out to UNR as a uh, as a doctoral student. And um, after about a year or so, I took a stipend at the Center for Advanced Learning, um, which is a really cool program because it actually emerged um, in the behavior analysis program at UNR um, and uh, just really grew and grew and, and sort of outgrew that university setting. Um, but I got a stipend at uh, the Center for Advanced Learning in my second academic year. Um, and I started as an instructor, and Kimberly Barons uh, really took me under her wing and supervised me throughout the years. And in 2004, I became the assistant director um, and continued to work closely under Kimberly as the assistant director. Um, and uh, when I graduated in 2010, took over as the founding director out here in the Western region. And um, I don't know if you want to hear a little bit about what we do here. Yes, please. So okay. you're the, what's the center called? It's now FIT Learning. Which stands for? Um, it doesn't actually stand for, uh, stand for anything. Oh, okay. It's, it's just a, FIT. Yeah, it's a metaphor. So we, um, we decided that the, you know, we really, what's cool is Kimberly actually started to ask parents, you know, what do you think about when you see your kid in our program? And parents started to describe cer certain aspects of our program like, well, I think of coaching and I think of fitness and, um, and uh, speed and agility. And we took all of these different descriptors and we thought, you know, fit learning is actually a really cool metaphor that captures the kind of work we do with kids here. And so we talk about producing cognitive fitness uh, with our learners. Um, and so that's why we uh, moved over to that new name to kind of capture more metaphorically the kind of work we do with kids here. I love it. It works on so many levels. You know, America has an obesity problem. So if we move on with this metaphor and move it into education, it works absolutely perfect. We have so many people in our educational system that just, for through no fault of their own, have problems. Absolutely. And, you know, um, so, you know, the nature of our, our business is uh, we are primarily a supplemental program for uh, for kids who are not just falling behind. I mean, we work with students who are gifted and talented and do academic acceleration, but 99% of the kids who come here are one or more academic years behind uh, and in, in one or more subject areas. Um, and we work with kids anywhere from three to about six hours a week, uh, doing one-on-one -on -one instruction primarily. Uh, we do have some small group stuff, but mostly we do one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a particular academic domain. Uh, mainly, our primary areas are uh, reading, math, um, language for comprehension, mm -hmm. and then expressive writing. Um, and uh, kids come for anywhere between 50 hours or 200 hours, depending on how far behind they are academically. Is that monthly? Um, no, that couldn't. It is, well, 50 hours would be the minimum instructional block that a student would enroll for. Yeah. And it depends on uh, how frequently they come per week, how long the program takes. Okay. So okay. if they did five hours a week, uh, we would be looking at a 10-week program for them. Right. Uh, and on average, they grow between one and two academic years in those first 50 hours, which is totally awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's really cool, and another reason we kind of landed on the fit learning, is because most parents call and they think we're tutoring. 
Um, and we're definitely not tutoring. Uh, we talk about ourselves as a transformational learning program um, because the, the way that we structure our, um, our sessions with kids, it's dynamic, it's interactive. Um, we're using the chart to measure uh, progress on everything from acquiring concepts to being able to fluently engage in uh, reading of words, identifying letters. Letters, um, and uh, incorporate several evidence-based practices into that model. And so kids really learn to learn here. Um, and often you get progress and movement in academic areas that we aren't actually targeting. Um, so we talk about it as a transformational learning program. Mm -hmm. Our goal really is to transform the kids who walk through our door, have them walk out very different learners than they walked in. So you have uh, you have your model is one on one with three to six hours per kid per week, and I'm assuming most of your folks this would be coming after school, or do you also have older folks who come in during the day? Uh, most of our kids come after school. Um, we do have a small group of students who are homeschooled that come during the um, earlier hours and supplement their homeschool programs with our uh, sort of core curriculum areas. Um, but uh, primarily, our kids show up at around 3.30. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about, let's pick one of your areas such as reading. You said you have evidence-based programs. So you have someone that comes to you from the school who is struggling. Do you provide, you know, what's that look like for reading? Do you have some type of global assessment you give them and then you plug them into a reading program that's supplemented with precision teaching? You know, walk me through what that would look like for one of your learners. Sure. Um, the first thing that we do uh, in terms of a global assessment, we haven't found that standardized tests are particularly useful for placing a child in our curriculum. Um, and so uh, Dr. Behrens, um, Kimberly, uh, actually did a lot of work in designing a curriculum based assessment um, that is linked to the uh, state standards of the school district here. And so we, for reading, for example, there are about uh, 100 different reading pen points that we evaluate in that curriculum-based assessment that is then linked up to a particular uh, state standard and grade level so that we can kind of talk to parents a little bit around where their child would fall with respect to grade level according to those standards, but also allows us to pinpoint exactly where to pace, place a child in our curriculum. Um, and after we, and then we also use uh, CBM or curriculum based measurement um, uh, tools to evaluate grade level performance as well. That's part of our assessment uh, in addition to the other pinpoints. And then once we have that assessment, we uh, design a curriculum for that particular child based on the curriculum based assessment, uh, assign an instructional team. We have a case manager that's responsible for uh, ensuring day to day progress on that child's program. Uh, and generally, we're hitting between 12 and 15 skills in a 50-minute session. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty packed, pretty packed session. And then after 40 hours of instruction in an academic area, we re-administer that curriculum-based assessment. But we also monitor uh, progress towards grade level every week using Ames Web CBM materials. I see. So you're... What is the driving, you have a curriculum-based assessment, but what's the dr underlying curriculum? Is it, the curriculum is what, uh, what Kim developed originally? It is a, uh, a, just a hodgepodge of a variety of different things. You know, when we first opened our doors, we must have ordered thousands of dollars of curriculum. Mm. Um, and I think that any precision teacher comes to know that there is no uh, set of, of curriculum materials that are going to meet all of your needs. 
Um, and so we have a lot of materials we bought. We have some of Elizabeth Houghton's materials. We have some Morningside materials. We've developed a, and a lot of our materials in-house. Um, so, you know, we pull from direct instruction materials. Um, so we, we utilize those things, but we almost always supplement, um, particularly some of the direct instruction materials that we use. We supplement in terms of adding additional fluency-based practice, um, sheets, materials, stimuli. Uh, so we kind of borrow and adapt as needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to say it's, it's not necessarily curriculum matters, but the curriculum is only one piece of the equation. Um, so, you know, curriculum absolutely matters, but that measurement piece is so absolutely critical to evaluating the effectiveness of the curriculum and the effectiveness of the uh, efforts to teach the concepts in that curriculum. Uh, and so we are so guided by our measurement here. And that's really, you know, it's really common for parents to say, uh, you know, when I'm talking to them on the phone, what curriculum do you use? And uh, they're not familiar with a lot of the materials that we use, but that's an opportunity for me to talk about, you know, it's not necessarily just about the curriculum that's really important but just a curriculum introduced in a standard way for every child isn't going to meet the educational needs of every child. Uh, you really need a really sensitive tool for measuring the effectiveness of that sequence for that child. Um, so because of the way that we measure things, we've identified that some of our curriculum materials are fantastic as is, and other ones really need a lot of supplementation. That is a wonderful explanation of the importance of measurement. I'm glad that I got that on tape because when people listen, they need to understand, you know, this is the power of having precision teaching with the curriculum, and that was very well said. You see a lot of students, and in the context of, well, reading or any of your other skills, what surprised you? What have been some discoveries you've made that you're like, wow, you know, this really surprises me? You know, I think one of the coolest discoveries that, I mean, we, we're making discoveries all the time, and it's, it's so cool. I, you know, before I get into answering that question, I'll say that, you know, before I came to um, what was the Center for Advanced Learning, now Fit Learning, I had about a two-year burnout rate at uh, whatever position I was in, even if it was at a company and I was promoted to a new position, about two years, and I just felt like I had gotten all that I could get out of of that particular position, um, that I, there was a ceiling placed on my learning. And, you know, now here I've been uh, working in the same job since 2002, and I never stop learning. And new discoveries are made all the time, and it's awesome. It's so exciting, and it's so cool to be at a place where because of the way that you're measuring and taking data on things, you're constantly assessing in the context of intervening and making new discoveries and evolving as a function of those discoveries. And I just, I mean, the, the job satisfaction that comes out of that is, is just um, incredible. Uh, one of the coolest discoveries uh, to me that we've made here, um, you know, I really had the pleasure of getting to spend all of the years here at the center with Kimberly and Nick Behrens. Uh, Nick Behrens, who was a Steve Hayes student, uh, Kimberly, who is just one of the smartest people I know and, and just extremely chart savvy. Um, you know, we started to find that there were a handful of kids who were moving through our reading program, achieving reading fluency, but comprehension uh, wasn't showing improvement as a function of improvements in reading fluency. 
And, uh, you know, that was a problem that really interested us. And I went and spent some time at Morningside and I was just blown away by their efforts of how they teach um, comprehension there. So I came back and I ordered the comprehension curriculum that they use and I was so excited and I set out to run it with kids. And the kids that we have here are different. The population is quite different than the population at Morningside. And I found that the curriculum that I chose assumed a certain foundational repertoire of the students entering the program, even at the lowest level. The first lesson in the book, the first few lessons, teaches the components of main idea and inference, and my kids couldn't get past that. And so Kimberly and Nick and I, uh, you know, locked ourselves in the conference room for several hours one day and started to brainstorm on the language components that are necessary for reading comprehension. And that, uh, lo and behold, ended up uh, being my dissertation um, and has resulted in an extensive curriculum line that we've developed here now in-house that is resulting in, in pretty great improvements in reading comprehension for kids. Um, so to me, that's the most exciting discovery that we've made. Um, I, I just, I really, really enjoy that work. And it's so neat to see how, when you improve kids' language about describing things in their world and relating things in their world in terms of increasing uh, degrees of complexity, and then you measure reading comprehension, and to see that improve as a function of that language training is just such a neat thing. Um, so that's that's my coolest discovery. But mm -hmm. uh, as I said, there there's discoveries just about every day. Um, which is awesome. So that what you were just talking about when you work on getting students to describe more things is that talk more about that. Do you mean that they dis, what are they dis, what are they describing? Well, here's what's interesting. You know, if you think about um, you know you can really look at. Uh, um, you know, any resource in education that's talking about comprehension and some of the critical uh, factors in comprehension uh, that are discussed are things like being able to make predictions and mm -hmm. inferences, uh, bring to bear your personal history, relate what you're reading to what you already know, uh, being able to identify similarities and differences uh, among things you're reading, things that you've read before. Etc. So those are pretty complex skills, and each of those things in them have many component behaviors. And as a precision teacher, obviously we're interested in component behaviors. Um, so if the component behaviors of, you know, if you break down inference, you know, what goes into inference? Well, what we started to look at was, you know, inference requires, it's actually a class, at, at least partially a classification skill. You have to be able to uh, make some kind of a classification statement about certain details within the text. And so instead of working on that in the context of reading, we actually isolated classification itself and started to work on fluency building in classification, uh, classifying groups of objects, classifying um, actions, and then measured their ability to come up with main idea, et cetera. So, and then with describing, my gosh, you can have kids describe a pig and a cow, and then you go measure their story retell. And if you actually can get them to describe things like a pig, a cow, a cup, a couch, a chair, a phone, a sweater, uh, fluently and uh, flexibly, right? So not just in terms of the things that are, are readily visible, but also those kinds of features that we can't see with an object, like a sweater is, uh, it can be warm. Um, you know, if you can get kids fluent and flexible at describing just common things in their world, what we're finding is that translates in the, to their ability to be able to describe what they're reading or what they're hearing in more fluent and flexible ways. That that's fascinating. Have you thought about causally what's going on there? Well, um, yes. I, I'm a fan of relational frame theory. 
Uh, and so that's really the theory that, um, that I tend to uh, lean towards in describing the kind of operants that are strengthened in that kind of training. Um, I mean, if you consider that relating itself is an operant, then, uh, then you know, that would generalize to, if it's a generalized operant relating in terms of similarity, relating in terms of distinction, then we shouldn't necessarily have to train it at the level of complexity that's entailed in reading comprehension. If you can strengthen that behavior in other situations, uh, presumably, if it's an operant, it would generalize over to those other contexts. And, and that seems to be what we're finding. Um, and so, yeah, relational frame theory is sort of our go-to in terms of understanding the underlying processes there. Well, there certainly is a lot of research to be done in that particular area. And I applaud your efforts, especially putting that into reading. That's just such a... It's such a big area, and there's so many tasks that go into what we call comprehension. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, and here's something that's really cool about that, Rick. You know, when we do that curriculum-based assessment, um, we have one for our... Um, our language curriculum as well. And on that, we use a tool called the Qualitative Reading Inventory to measure um, reading comprehension. And the Qualitative Reading Inventory has uh, two different types of comprehension tasks. One of them is comprehension of a narrative passage, and then the other is comprehension of an expository passage. And, you know, with that curriculum-based assessment and the various tools that we have, different patterns that show up on those assessments can give us different information to talk to about parents in terms of the variables that are contributing to poor comprehension. So, you know, if we have a child who shows up um, poor in reading but strong in the language skills, then we can, uh, uh, you know, um, assert that it is likely more the reading that is impacting comprehension than the language. You mean the decoding? Uh, yeah, decoding, reading fluency. Mm -hmm. So yeah, phonemic awareness, oral reading fluency, uh, sight word reading. All We look at all of those elements. Mm -hmm. um, so if a, a child shows up strong on those language targets, then that gives us a good indication that, you know, the reading is real, really where we want to focus our initial efforts. However, if a child shows up really weak in those relational skills that I was talking about, um, being able to relate, you know, in terms of similarity and differences, um, relating hierarchically, uh, perspective taking, um, you know, if a child shows up really weak in those skills and shows up weak in reading, then I generally make the recommendation to work on the language side of things first. Uh, because it's even more fundamental than the reading repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's even interesting, the patterns, you know, um, even if kids have the appropriate language skills in place to support reading comprehension, and they have the uh, strong reading skills in place to support reading comprehension, when it comes to dense textual material, expository stuff like history and science texts, uh, more factual information, uh, kids also need strategies for how to go about engaging with material at that level. And so even on our assessment, if a child shows up really strong in their narrative comprehension, but poor and expository, then that's an indication that they need more strategies-based training. So it's so cool. In fact, we're presenting on this at um, a conference in, in D.C. in July about, you know, it's so cool how our assessment alone gives so much information about how we tailor our approach with a particular learner. Um, it's just, it's, it's really neat to be able to sit across from a parent and talk about, uh, you know, I really think language is a factor in your child's um, comprehension or mathematic abilities right now. And you can even talk about, um, based on these language skills, I bet that um, organizational skills at home aren't that great. 
I bet that they have a hard time uh, taking notes in class, uh, writing papers. And parents really, you know, it, it's amazing to parents that I can look at that, that those results on the assessment and be able to pinpoint things that are showing up at home, even though they haven't told me about those things. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really powerful, really powerful mm -hmm. tool. What money? What many parents don't get, and even teachers, I think, to a great extent, is the framework that you're laying out. When we talk about reading, reading is language that's in code. So if you have a problem with language, you're going to have a problem with the reading. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just, you know, reading isn't some magical thing where, you know, all of a sudden, you can fix the reading, but not fix the language. And when I oftentimes work with students with autism, that's what I get all the time. The parents will say, well, you know, he can read really well, but he doesn't understand it. And I always like to point out that reading is broken up into two categories, decoding and comprehension. It's just a nice way of categorizing. And then, of course, they work together. And uh, I was thinking about all this when you were talking about your language skills in things like perspective taking. Now, is that something that you've been working on? Because I'm, of course, for my own selfish reasons, very interested in how can we help students you know, teach them perspective taking and then if, you know, is there a way to put that into a fluency perspective? There is. Um, we are working on it, and um, we have actually developed a fluency-based program. I mean, it's now it's not free operant. Um, yeah, it can't be, of course. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, I guess you know, I there maybe there's a way to wrap the head around figuring that out. But um, all of the work coming out of you know an RFT, they talk about the um, the perspective taking relations as dectics. Um, so it's I, you, here, there, now, then are the ones that they are the relations that they um, speak to. And there's actually a study that uh, is coming out in the psych record here pretty soon. It's Tim Weil. Um, he did his dissertation on uh, dectic frames and he used the, the standard theory of mind assessment um, to uh, as a pre post with his kids, and then he did uh, dectics training. So I, you, and here, there, and now, then, and they actually got into what they call reversals, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, you know you're sitting with your learner and you say, I have a black shirt, you have a brown shirt. Uh, if I were you, what would you be wearing? Uh, if you were me, what would you be wearing? Um, and so they do these reversals and, uh, and then they even have triple reversals, which get really, really crazy. Uh, you know, if I were you and here was now and now is then, and you know, um, uh, kind of crazy training like that. But what Tim's study showed is that that training resulted in improvements on that sort of standard classic theory of mind assessment. Um, and, uh, he didn't do fluency building, however. So in house, uh, here at the center for some of our students, we are doing the fluency building component to it. Uh, we've set aims, uh, here in house. We've got probes in place to evaluate, um, uh, more real world type perspective taking tasks. So if we, we provide a scenario like, um, you know, Sally lost her puppy. Uh, how might Sally feel? Uh, if you are Sally, how might you feel? What could happen to make Sally feel better? What might happen to you to make you feel like Sally feels? Um, and so even though we're doing the more standard training package that's been employed in RFT, the, the IU here, there, now, then broken up into components um, or slices, uh, we're measuring a more realistic perspective taking task. Um, this is really new for us, so I can't speak a lot to the data, but hopefully we'll pre be presenting something next year at uh, ABAI. Where, where does this pay off? So let's say you get really good. This shows up in the assessments you do. Like, How does this translate into that next skill? 
Um, well, I mean, I think that the coolest test of this, well, here, this is one of the coolest things that we've done when we were just first starting to play around with this a little bit. Are you familiar with Doug Greer's work in writer immersion? Yes. Okay. So we took a student who was, um, performed poorly on our perspective taking tasks. And we started doing fluency building in those dectic uh, frames. So the IU and uh, here, there are actually the ones that she had trained on at this point. And then as a probe, we were doing a variation of the writer immersion task where the student sat across from the instructor and the student was looking at a picture and telling the instructor how to recreate the picture, but they were sitting across from one another. So mind you, she had to actually, you know, she had to reverse the left and the right. Uh, she had to describe in significant detail how to recreate that, um, that picture. And she had a lot of, we started this probe with her prior to beginning the perspective taking. And obviously we only have one student, but uh, what her chart showed, which is so neat, is that when she got fluent in the uh, IU reversals, which means, you know, like I gave the example earlier, I have blonde hair, you have brown hair. If you were me, what color hair would you have? When we started training on that and she hit around our fluency aim, we actually saw that her ability to tell the person that's sitting, that sitting across from her how to draw a picture uh, to match the one she was looking at improved. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> Which was really cool because you think about that in terms of, you know, I love Greer's work on the effect of writing on the reader. Um, it's, it's really neat. And so that's, um, I think that there's utility in it for that. And certainly when you think about reading comprehension, taking the perspective of the author, uh, you know, understanding author's purpose. Um, we don't have those measures in place right now, but that's certainly something we would strive for in the future. Mm -hmm. When you do your timings, how long is the timing and what are you counting? We count, uh, the timing is one minute. Uh, and we are counting each, uh, you know, so the, if the question was, you know, I have blonde hair, you have brown hair. If you were me, what color hair would you have? If the learner says uh, brown uh, or blonde, then that would be one click, one correct response. And what aim do they, what's the aim you're playing with right now? Right now, we have the aim of 20 per minute. Wow. So, so you can, uh, you have time to speak and, I mean, that can, you can get 20 a minute. That seems like a lot of language in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and I, I tell you what, man, uh, kids hit that aim. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, we've set that aim just by testing our staff here, we came up with an aim range. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's you know, we try to keep the, uh, the longer the statements, the more it's going to impose a ceiling on the learner response, of course, but we try to keep them rather brief. Mm hmm. You do a lot of work at your center, so I can see you packing in, just even reflecting on what you said earlier, that you in a 50-minute session, you get upwards to 12 or 15 skills. How do you maintain quality control? How do you make sure people are charting? I mean, how, how do you manage that with your center? Um, we have a pretty cool system here that I think works really well. Um, the way that our center is structured is we have a case advisor, um, which is uh, you know someone who has worked with us for a while, has at least a master's degree uh, in behavior analysis. Um, right now, myself and Donnie Newsom are the only case advisors here. Uh, there's a case advisor that oversees the um, oversees the case as a whole. Uh, and then each student is assigned a case manager, uh, and that person works with the student, maybe not every day, but definitely works with the student every week and um, ensures that things are maintained on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. And then we have an instructional team that is assigned to each child, and that instructional team stays the same. 
uh, throughout the child's enrollment. And, you know, I, it's so funny when, again, another question I get from parents a lot is, well, uh, what are the, um, what's the credentials of your staff? Uh, how do I know that they're qualified? And, you know, they don't need to know a single thing about behavior analysis or precision teaching. They need to be great with kids. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I look for, that they have a, uh, a dynamic personality, that they can keep kids engaged, that they, you know, are really committed to making a difference with children. And uh, we have an extensive training program where we use precision teaching to teach our instructors how to do precision teaching. And so it's a fluency-based training program. They start as interns. And by the time they are ready to work with kids, they are little mini behavior analysts. They can already identify patterns and data that need attention. And so my instructors start to, uh, you know, they can identify if there's a program that needs to be flagged for the case manager to look at. And if the case manager can't problem solve that, then the case manager seeks out the case advisor. Um, and then the case advisor looks at every kid's book every week. Um, so that is, uh, that's how we maintain the quality assurance. Uh, we have just really, really incredibly trained, um, instructors. In fact, uh, one of the, um, students, uh, you know, by the time they leave here, a lot of times the undergraduates who are working with us have more experience in data analysis, uh, and, and sort of, um, scope and sequence than many graduate students that I know. Um, they get experience writing up uh, programs for kids. And uh, I mean, it's amazing how well-trained individuals get when they have that immediate feedback uh, that's provided by utilizing the standard acceleration chart in session. I mean, it's just immediate feedback for their behavior. They know when they need to practice a program because they're imposing a ceiling on a student's performance. They know when uh, there's a reinforcement problem. They know when it's a, a uh, skill problem that we need to troubleshoot um, more specifically for that child. I mean, it's just really cool. Um, we also incorporate chart shares into our staff meetings. So we get staff really great at describing uh, behavior on the chart, analyzing patterns on the chart, uh, different trends. So uh, those are our efforts, uh, the efforts that we make to ensure that the quality assurance is in place, whether I'm in the chair with a kid or an undergrad student is in the hmm. chair. Let me ask you... Uh... We're starting to approach the end of our time here. Is there anything I could have asked you or anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't discuss yet? You know, um, this is something that I think is uh, uh, kind of cool to mention, and, and I don't know the audience that will be listening to this. I might be preaching to the choir, but... Um, I, I like to talk about why I chose the chart. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, Rick, that, you know, I, I, the chart was the first thing that I learned how to measure any kind of behavior on. And then I went off into the early intervention world um, with kids with autism and I moved into Excel graphing. And uh, with the standard mastery criteria of, you know, 80% correct across three consecutive sessions. And, you know, it's not as if those kids didn't make amazing progress. They absolutely made great progress. But there were a lot of barriers to um, to that progress. I mean, I, you know, it's things were constantly being put back into acquisition once they were mastered. Um, and, uh, you know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and I came to UNR and I started learning about the chart and I started to see how powerful I was as a scientist um, and as a behavior analyst when I had that much information at my fingertips. Um, and that I really could see really subtle differences in learning using such a sensitive uh, dimension of behavior. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
I never really understand the, you know, even my advisor uh, through graduate school, he's not a charter. And I, I never could understand how a behavior analyst wouldn't want the most sensitive measure available and the most information, most information available to make decisions on. And, uh, you know, so even though in, in, you know, he's doing great work. I just, I love to think of what kinds of discoveries they might be making if they were utilizing a more sensitive tool. Um, so I think that, you know, gosh, if you could just inspire one behavior analyst to go out, not one behavior analyst, we'll say one a week, to go <laughs> out and just practice charting something. I mean, you're not going to see the difference in a day, I don't think. I don't even know that you're going to see a difference in a week. But if you keep using that tool until you make some discovery that you never would have made utilizing a Excel graphing, I think that, you know, that's how people select this tool. Um, you know, I, I don't like to come off as being dogmatic about utilizing the chart. I don't think that it's the perfect tool for data display. Um, but man, I just think that you can't beat it where data analysis is concerned. And I think that as behavior analysts, we want to make discoveries and we're about analysis. So um, I'd like to inspire as many people as possible to really embrace the analysis side of our field. I'm glad you brought that up. Our audience is, it's a mixed bag. We certainly have a portion of people who are precision teachers, but we also hear from people who are trying to figure out what is this thing called precision teaching. You know, we have speech therapists, we have teachers, we have, uh, you know, we hear from all types of people. In fact, I actually heard from a prison counselor uh, a few months ago, so wow. it's uh, it's 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 a a diverse audience, and hearing what you say is a very nice message for people to to take in. I've always said that if I ever get elected ABA president, what I'm going to do in my speech, so I'm tipping my hand here <laughs> for for next year when I'm elected. Uh, I'm gonna. I wouldn't tell everybody that the next great discovery isn't going to be made. So if we want to move our science forward, we're not going to move our science forward by discovering this new thing, this like reinforcement or whatever. The way our science is going to move forward is when we start having a standard view and we fundamentally look at behavior through the lens of a tool that shows us, it gives us a different perspective. And I'm like you too. I know so many behavior analysts in the field that, well, some that just flat out dismiss it. And when they dismiss it, that bothers me because it's it's one thing if you don't know about the chart and you say, well, you know, I don't know about it. But it's another thing when you really don't know about it and you're like, well, you know, it's the same thing as any other chart. It's not. And, you know, hearing you, hearing your story, it's very inspirational. And let me say that you are not just a wonderful ambassador for the chart. You're really an ambassador for good applied science. And for that, you know, I applaud you. Well, what a very nice compliment. Thank you. So we're at the end of our time, and on behalf of the audience of the Precision Teaching Podcast and myself and co-host, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that was another phenomenal interview, and ah, what can you say? The, the podcast, we have uh, some wonderful people that we get a chance to interview, and you know, listening to Kendra speak about her past experiences. And, and whenever we interview someone like Kendra, I always feel very honored that I am practicing in a field with, with people like her. And, of course, people like all of you, my, my wonderful rogues gallery, uh, who are just doing phenomenal things with kids. So good interview. 
Yep, she's the best. Well, do we have any announcements? Any closing comments? No, sir. Nope. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Great. I'm like, announcements? Are we waiting for someone to big announcement or something? <laughs> no. I was unprepared for announcements. Yeah, I, 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 I came prepared for everything else. I don't have any announcements. Okay. <laughs> we'll just end the show. All um, right. On behalf of Doug Kosowitz, Harry Milico, and Sean Datchik, I'm Rick Cabina, and I thank you for listening to the Precision Teaching Podcast.